Oh, what up? Welcome to the True North Church podcast, where we gather to explore faith, find inspiration, and strengthen our spiritual connection. At True North, we exist to help people navigate through the oceans of life in the direction that lands at the heart of God. Each week, we'll dive into meaningful discussions, share uplifting stories, and delve into the teachings that guide our lives. Whether you're a longtime member or a first-time listener, we're grateful to have you join us on this journey. So, let's embark on this episode of Faith, Community, and Discovery together. Like they used to say when I was a kid, may not be when you want it, may not come when you want it, but what, what he gives to you, it will always be right on what? Time. Right on time. He's an on-time guy. Yes, he is. There you go. Woo! Put that in your playlist. All right. So we're going to start Good Ground Chapter 2, where we're bringing it back. We're hopping back in the series. This is something the Lord put. So it's going to be, this whole series is going to be a renewing. It may be a refresh. And some of you may be like, I've heard this before. And some of you be like, oh, I, I, I didn't see that before. And that's what I'm hoping. Amen. So if you have a Bible, we're going to start in Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. If you don't, it's all good. We'll put it on the screen. Uh, I, I meant to grab, I meant to go by uh, the, the, the feed store and grab one, but I don't know if anybody's ever planted vegetables or fruit before, or you've known anybody to plant vegetables or fruit. But if you didn't know this, you can go to the store and get a seed packet. You get a seed pack. You literally go right here, Tractor Supply, or go to any feed store in town. And if you want to get uh, tomato seeds, you want to start growing tomato seeds, because I don't know what the price of tomatoes are, but if they're anything like everything else, they've gone up. You can go in the store and literally say, I want some tomato seeds. And they will hand you a packet. And on that packet, the greatest thing ever, are you ready? There's a picture of the tomatoes. Mind-blowing. What's in the packet the picture is on there. So therefore, you know, you look at the picture like, ah, oh, tomatoes. But when you open that pack, it's just a little bitty seed. So the picture on the front tells you what's in store, what's going to happen, what's coming. When you plant the seed, this is the picture on the packet. I don't know those that uh, I remember, uh, you know, getting Legos for Christmas. You know, you have the picture on the box. You know, you got the kid playing with the full set and all these different things. But for some reason, when you put it together, there's always something missing. Like, ah, I, I, we got extra Legos or we got extra pieces. You know, I hate it when I have to put a bookshelf together because I, I always end up with extra pieces. It don't look like it, it's similar to what's on the box. Maybe nobody else goes through that, but cool deal. That's me, I guess. But I always have extra pieces laying around. So the picture of what's in store is always on the front. In Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, Jesus, he gives us this parable about this very thing. He says this, he says, once again, Jesus went to teach the people on the shore of Lake Galilee, and a massive crowd surrounded him. The crowd was so huge that he had to get into a boat and teach the people from there. He taught them many things by using parables to illustrate spiritual truths. Watch this. He says this in verse three. Consider this. A, for, a farmer went out to sow seeds. As he cast his seeds, some of it fell along the beaten path, and soon the birds came and ate it. Some of this may sound familiar to y'all. Other seeds fell onto gravel with no topsoil, and the other seeds quickly sprouted since the soil had no depth. But when the days grew hot, the sprouts were scorched and withered because they had insufficient roots. Other seeds fell among the thorns. So when the seeds sprouted, so did the thorns, crowding out the young plants so that they could produce no grain. Verse 8, but some of the seeds fell onto good ground. Somebody said good ground. Good, rich soil that kept producing a good harvest, some yielding 30, some 60, and some even 100 times as much as was planted. If you understand this, then you'll need to respond. So I love this because Jesus tells this. He literally gives this parable to remind us that our heart, put your hand on your chest real quick so I know, so you know it's beating in case you didn't wonder if it was beating. All right, so Jesus says that this heart right here, this, this, this thing that's pumping, this soul, this, your soul, it's like soil in the ground. It's like soil in the ground. And he says this, he says literally that God, who is the farmer, he sows his word into us. His purpose for us is to be conformed into the image of Jesus. It's to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Amen. Watch this. Jesus is our picture on the seed packet. 
Jesus is your pitcher on the seed packet. God is literally planting seeds in this heart, seeds in this mind, seeds in your soul. And the pitcher on that packet, it's Jesus. Who we are becoming like is Jesus. Who we are going to become more like is Jesus. That's who he wants to make you like. Amen. Amen. Not long hair, robe, and sandals has nothing to do with that. No, but it's in the manner that he walked. It's in the authority that he walked in. It's in the patience that he practiced. It's in the peace that he exuberated. He wants us to walk in such a manner that no matter what physical storm or metaphorical storm is brewing in your life, you can literally sleep in the midst of it because it doesn't bother you. I remember back when I was in college, and, and uh, I don't know if you all remember, but the, the tornadoes ripped through Tennessee. I was in East Tennessee, and, you know, we was under tornado warning and all this other stuff. And, uh, and I remember, like, the satellite went out. And I was like, well, that's okay. You know, I got plan B. So I literally went to Walmart, picked up my favorite frozen pizza, single life, you can do this. And, uh, well, I wasn't saying I was engaged, but still, I was single. Kelsey was living in Virginia. And, uh, and I remember I went and picked up my, my favorite frozen pizza, Simple Towns back then. Went back to the house, pulled out every DVD, all my favorite DVDs, and literally just popped them in and just did a marathon until I fell asleep. And I literally fell asleep. And y'all, when I woke up the next day, uh, I, I checked my phone. I turned my phone off because I was like, ah, you know, ain't nothing else to do, whatever. Now, I wasn't thinking about somebody may want to check on me. When I, tur when I turned my phone on, I had, I, had I, th I think if I remember correctly, 13 missed calls. Who knows how many voicemails? Several of them from yours truly. A few of them from mom and dad, a few of them from uh, former roommates and all this. And finally, when I called Kelsey's back, uh, she, she screamed, Lindsay. I said, hey, hey, girl, what, what are you doing? She's like, what have you been doing? And I said, uh, well, I, I just woke up. She's like, it's the next day. And I said, I, yeah, no, that's why I'm calling. It's the next day. And y'all, I do not tell this story. I'm not, I'm not fabricating, but literally a mile from, and that was the house that we was, that I'd, uh, we was renting or I was renting and she was going to move in once we got married. Literally a mile up the road, the tornado had touched down and ripped out every apartment complex while your boy was just soundly sleeping away. And she's like, how can you sleep through that? I said, ah, uh, Jesus slept through the storm. So, um, hey, it's just like, no. No. Now, whether you're able to physically walk in that type of peace when a physical storm is happening or whether you're able to walk in that type of peace when everybody is against you, that's what Jesus wants for you. That's what our Father, God, that's what he wants for us to exuberate peace that nothing, nothing sways your heart. Amen. I love this because in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says this. He says, for you have acquired new creation life which is continually being renewed in the likeness of the one who created you, giving you the full revelation of God. I love that Paul said that we are continually being renewed. That means it's an ongoing process. That means the moment that you accepted Jesus into your heart, the moment you place your trust and confidence in him, there is a renewal process that is happening as you are sitting right now. As you are listening to the sound of my voice, as you are blinking, as you are riding, as you are taking all this in, you are being renewed. There is a renewing process. You can't see it. It's not on the surface. It's underneath the surface. Amen. It's not on top of the skin. It's underneath the skin. And this renewal process, it's conforming you more into the image of God. It's conforming you more into the image of Christ. So Paul said that we are continually being renewed into the image of Christ, but also he says this, so we can have the full revelation of God. The full revelation of God. Why, why do we need the full revelation of God? Obviously, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have mentioned it. But why would we need the full revelation of God? I would say this way. I'll answer that with another question. Is our revelation of God fully sound? Do we have the right revelation of God? Do we have the full understanding? The, the, the God that we love, the God that we sing to, the God that we worship, is it the one that's biblically found or portrayed in Jesus? Or is it one that is uh, wrapped and made in the image of our comforts, made in the image of our likes and dislikes? Oh, I'm coming for you this morning. It's the Jesus that you love and serve and pay tie to. Is it the one that we read in the Gospels, the one that saves and delivers and holds us accountable? 
Or is it the Jesus that looks like our likes and dislikes? Is it the Jesus that literally we have made in our own image? Is it the Jesus that, that looks like our denomination? Or is it the Jesus that looks like our traditions? Is it the one that looks like what we like and what we dislike? See, we're being conformed to the image of Christ, not the other way around. We are being conformed to Jesus, not Jesus being conformed to us. Jesus is the standard, not you. We're not the standard. He's the standard. He is who we, is, uh, 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 he is who we inspire to be like, not be more like ourselves. We live in a world that says, oh, you got to do you. There was a song we was going to sing this morning, and we just didn't get to it. But literally, the, the first part of the verse literally says that the world tells me to do what I want to do, live my life. I'm here to tell you, your life is not your own. In fact, the Old Testament says that life is but a vapor. Here today and what? Gone the next. Gone the next. I heard, I heard a great theologian say, our life is like an ice cube taken out of the freezer, taken out of the fridge, taken out of a glass and set on a table. Constantly melting away until it's nothing. That's your life. So within that span of that ice cube, you got to make this one life count. Amen. You got to make it count for all that you have been given to. But we are being conformed to the image of Christ, not the other way around. We made Jesus in our image when we put him in our everyday scenarios. And then we determine the outcome of what we think he would want us to do. When we place Jesus in our everyday scenarios and then we determine the outcome based off of what we want it to be. Lindsay, what do you mean by that? You know, where we have the election coming up in a couple months. If you are anywhere on TV, anywhere on your phone, it is the thing, as soon as you open up, that's the first thing you see. Dirt about this person, dirt about that person at work or, or the post office or the pharmacy or a girl. You will, you will literally run into conversations where ev anybody and everybody is willing to give their opinion. You know, I had somebody ask me, they said, well, Lindsay, how do you think Jesus will vote? And I'm like, they're like, yeah, yeah, if Jesus were to go down to Broad Street and hop in the voting pool, who would he vote for? Because whoever he's going to vote for, that's who I want to vote for. I'm like, let's, let, we got to back this thing up. Let's, 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 let's backtrack. Let's throw this thing in reverse. I said, so we are imagining that Jesus would go out and go to the poll and vote for the betterment of America. Well, yeah. I'm like, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And they're like, yeah. I said, that means that he's in charge. He doesn't have to subscribe to the party of the donkeys or the party of the elephants. In fact, guess what? Every animal bows down to God. Every animal bows down to Jesus. And they say, well, what do you mean? So literally, if, if he's sovereign, then he doesn't have to vote. He is the standard that we ascribe to. So many times we conform Jesus to our image. Lindsay, are you saying we don't have to vote? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if we put Jesus in our everyday scenarios and then we determine the outcome based off of what we want it to be, that's idolatry. That's idolatry because we have conformed Jesus to be like us instead of us being like Jesus. We think about it. If Jesus, when Jesus raises up leaders, he looks for one for one criteria, is their heart moldable? Is, is, is there space in their heart? Is, is this something I can use? Is this heart something I can use? The heart of David, was the heart of David something, I could, something he could use? Yes. The heart of uh, even King Saul, was it something he could use? Yes. No. I mean, you could go down the line. God is all about using hearts using hearts. He looks for hearts that are palatable, hearts that he can use, hearts that he can shape and mold, hearts that he can speak through, not just to. Amen? amen. Literally, we are so consumed with conforming Jesus in our image when really it's the opposite. We are conformed in his image. Amen? A Jesus that's conformed in our image, that is idolatry. That's idolatry. If Jesus looks more like you versus you looking like him, there's, that's a problem. If God looks more like you, if God likes what you like versus you like and what he, there's a problem. Amen. There is a problem. Colossians 3.10, we just read it, but literally Paul said that we are continually being renewed into whose likeness? The likeness of the one who created you. 
We are continually being renewed in his likeness. How does God renew us in his likeness? We read it last Sunday, but let's read it again. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Paul says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be, what's that word? Conformed to the what? Image of his son. Woo! So let me let me let me bring it back to speed. Let me help you out this morning. We said last week that you know this scripture, God works all things out for the good. It didn't Paul didn't say God works everything out for your good. It, no, the good. There's a difference. Your good and the good. So therefore, your good is different than God's definition of good. You're good. Can I, I'm, I'm just I'm gonna pick on me. I'm gonna pick on me this morning. I'll save you some. All right. We're going to, you know, keep keep the cushion on your toes. this morning. I'm gonna pick on me. But my good looks like a free, nice cup of coffee from Starbucks. Get that. Get that young and Java. Hallelujah. Had it, had it yesterday. No kids in the car. Kelsey at the house getting stuff ready for the little wedding shower, you know, and all that stuff. And I, you know, I had to go run and get stuff that we didn't have in Lexington. Go figure. Run to Jackson. <laughs> Run the Jets, and I'm like, well, I mean, you know, and, and I left early. Left early, I'm like, oh, I got a little time. I checked, uh, checked my little app, you know, got some stars. I was like, oh, I got, got some stars. Okay, you know what? It's been a hard week. Yes, it's been a hot week, Lindsay, go and treat you. That's, that's what the other Lindsay was saying to this Lindsay. I was, and you know what? Instead of rejecting, I said, you show right. So I just turned that blinker on, got off the interstate, you know, ordered it through the app free, pulled in, pulled in with a smile. They said, they said, uh, uh, can I take your, can I take your, I said, got a mobile order for Lindsay. Oh, we're working on it. I'm like, I bet you are. I'll be right around. Just whipped on around. You know, uh, uh, my good looks like that free. They're like, here you go. And I was like, appreciate it. You know, appreciate you. You, Hey, you be blessed, my brother. You know, all that stuff. Whip on the target, get the stuff. You know, I ain't got to ain't gotta fight kids on what kind of buggy we're going to get. You know, I didn't feel like taking the buggy. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to walk with the buggy. I can just walk in. So I walk in and I hear kids crying, but it ain't mine. So I just keep on walking. I'm like, whoo, yeah, that's your kid. Lady. You better get him. Mm. I would mind. I wouldn't do that to mine. Yep, yep. No, no. Get this. You know, I, you know, I, I might want a piece of candy. Nah, I'm, I gotta watch my figure. But I could if I wanted it and wouldn't have to share with anybody. A good, my good looks like all my lights being elevated into first place. But God's definition of good looks like Christ being elevated to first place. So therefore, when Paul says that God works everything out for the good, He's taking all the good things that are happening in your life. All the bad things that are happening in your life. And he's using those to point you in one direction. He's using you to make one thing happen. And that's to make you look and sound and walk like Jesus. Amen. He's using all that to conform you into the image of his son. Amen. I love that we are not being, we are not conforming Jesus in our image. He is conforming us in our image. In fact, one translation, it says, it says, instead of saying he works all things out for the good, it says that we are woven together. Ooh, I, I like that. Woven together, like a quilt. You know, I don't know if, if there's any people that sew in here. I don't sew, don't have that patience. I remember as a kid, I used to watch Granny. She'd get out the sewing machine. Mom, get out the sewing machine, the big old thing, uh, tuk, 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 and do all that. I don't have that. I remember in high school, we, uh, you know, we took, I signed up for economics class, and when I found out we was going to have to do a sewing thing, I switched classes real quick. I said, no, nah, no, nah. I, le I left my best friend in there. I said, bye, buddy. Sorry. This is what it is. So y'all can ask him if he learned how to sew. I don't know if he did or not. But, but the translation says that all things are woven together. And there's this, uh, there's this uh, theologian. He tells this story about this, about this man who, was a, who, who made great quilts. And, and one day he, uh, he had his granddaughter, it was either his granddaughter or his niece come over, and he was working on this quilt, and all she wanted to was to help him sew it. So he said, okay. So he gave her the, the, the pen and needle, and she's, and she's going, and listen, y'all, she's just making a mess. I mean, this guy, he's a master sewer. He made, I mean, makes all these kind of designs on these quilts, and she's just going a mess, just, just going everywhere. I mean, she's, you know, a little kid. What would you expect? When it was done and, and he had finished it, he hung it up in the house or whatever. And, you know, later on, a few weeks passed and they had a gathering and people come through and they would see that. And they're like, wow, when did you do that? That, that looks so beautiful. And he would say, well, me and my niece, we worked on this. She, she, did, she did most of it. Well, how, how, how could she have done that? You know, didn't, wouldn't she have messed up here and there? And, oh, she did. 
But I, I anticipated her every move. And I rerouted every, every stitch and every stroke. that she, I rerouted it to ultimately get to the purpose of finishing this quilt. See, that's what God does. Yes, you, yes, if you want to go get a cheeseburger, you go get a cheeseburger. Yes, you may go to the job that you go to tomorrow. But yes, at the end of the day, the master weaver, he reroutes every route that you take in your life. You may go down the wrong road and he's like, it's okay, we're just gonna, we're just gonna bypass this and take a left here. He's working everything out for the good to make you more like Jesus. Every stroke, every, every decision that you've made, he is rerouting it to get you more to be like his son. So I said it last week and I said it before, but when you are walking with God, you are never late. When you are walking with the Lord, when he's leading you, when he's directing you, you will never be late. Amen. You will never be late and you will never be in the wrong area. Verse, uh, verse 11 of Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> literally in other, uh, I'm trying to think if I put it in there. No, we just kept it at verse 10. But literally God takes everything and he reroutes it into work to our good. I love this because in Colossians chapter what is it? Yep, 3 verse 11. There it is. It says this, Paul says, In this new creation life, your nationality makes no difference. Or your ethnicity, education, or economic status, they matter nothing. For it is Christ that means everything as he lives in every one of us. In other words, it doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what political party you donate to. It doesn't matter how much you make a year. It doesn't matter your highest form of education. The only thing that identifies a person is, are you in Christ or are you not? Are you in Christ or are you not? You know, the kids, they've learned from me, but, you know, when we're all at the house and the door opens, even my little kids, they'll say, friend or foe, and they got a toy in their hand. Even the baby got torn, ready, gripping it, ready to, I don't know, do some damage. I don't know what they're going to do. But they've learned either you are a friend to the Meltons or you're a foe. And if you're a foe, oh, no, that's all I can tell you. Either you are in Christ or you are in Adam. That's what we talked about in the Good Ground series earlier this year. You are either in Christ, you are renewed. All things are new, all things are passed away. You get to spend eternity with him. You get to walk with him. He gets to walk with you on this side of heaven. You can talk to him. He can talk back. You can fellowship with him here and in heaven. But if you are in Adam, you are apart from God. So therefore, Paul says it doesn't matter because so many times we take pride in our ethnicity. We take pride in how our, the highest form of education or we take pride in the job that we work or we take pride in the kind of car we drive or the type of clothes we or the type of things that we abstain from. We take pride in all those things. And Paul says none of that matters. None of that matters. In fact, Dr. Tony Evans, he, you know, years ago, he, he said in a sermon where literally so many times we will attach our ethnicity before our Christian identity. We'll say, well, I'm a black Christian or I'm a white Christian or I'm a Hispanic Christian or I'm an Asian Christian. But at the end of the day, if you remember in English class, if y'all, we all remember in English class, we can go back to it. Some of the teachers, y'all can correct me later if I'm wrong. But literally, last time I checked, the adjective is the one that gives, he identifies, the adjective identifies the noun. Whatever the noun is, it changes once there's an adjective added to it. But last time I checked, you cannot change or add to Jesus. He's sovereign. He is sovereign. He is the noun that doesn't need an adjective. He is the noun that doesn't need our additives added to make our Christian experience better. I am a Christian first, and then I'm an African-American, or then I'm a black man. I'm a Christian first. I am redeemed. I am in Christ. Amen? Check this out. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, in the Mirror Study Bible, he says it this way. He says, the unveiling of Jesus, the unveiling of Jesus or of Christ as defining our lives immediately implies that what is evident in him is equally mirrored in you. The exact life on exhibit in Christ is now repeated in us. We are included in the same bliss and joined oneness with him just as his life reveals you. Your bliss and joined oneness with him just as he, just as his life reveals your life reveals him. I love this in the yellow. It says what is evident in him is equally mirrored in you. 
it's equally mirrored in you. Amen. Literally, Paul says in in uh, in Second Corinthians chapter five verse twenty when he says that we are called to be ministers of reconciliation. At one point, he says that it is as if God is speaking through you. It's as if God is speaking through you to your friends. It's as if God is speaking through you to your family members. It's as if God is speaking through you to your coworkers. Why? Because in the yellow, what's evident in Jesus is evident in you. It's mirrored. It's equally mirrored as in you. Amen. As he is, so are we in this world. Watch this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Peter says this, but you are God's chosen treasure. Priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God devoted ones, as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous what? <coughs> Light. And now he claims you as his very own. Here's the good part. It gets better. Here it is. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. Oh, let's run that back. Why did he save you? So you can show off what he did in your life. Why did he free you? So you can show off what he did in your life. Why did he heal you? Why did he deliver you? Why did he bring you out of darkness into marvelous light? So you could broadcast his glorious wonders to the world. Why else would we be a city that's set on a hill? Why else would you be a lamp that's set on a lampstand that should not be hidden? Amen. Why else would you, let me say it better this way, why else would you be at the job that you are? Why else would you be in the family that you are in? Why else would you be getting to, uh, why else would you be marrying into the family that you're being married into? Why else would you have the kids that you have? Why else would you be in this town and in this county so he can broadcast his glorious wonders to all that he wants it to see? Amen. To all that he wants to see. Literally, he saved us to bring us out of darkness. Because you don't deserve to be in darkness. Literally, he saved you to bring you out of obscurity. And then number two, he saved you so you would go tell everybody what he's done. So you would go tell everybody what he's done. So you would go tell her. Listen, your faith is not meant to be a secret. Your faith was never meant to be hidden. Amen. Your faith is never meant to be hidden. I remember yesterday at the wedding shower, a little bit later on that night, just because I felt like, just because I, just because I knew. Hey, you ever had those moments where you're just like, you, 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 you know what to do, you know what not to do, and you're like, you know what? I feel like rocking the boat. You ever, you ever had those moments? Just me. That's okay, Lindsay. All right, well, you can pray for me at the end. But last night, literally at one point, I just, I was like, you know what? I'm in the rocking the boat mood. I said, I said, Kelsey, man, it was, it was so good to see Maurice, wasn't it? She's like, yeah, it was, it was so good. Oh my God. I can't believe it. I said, I know all of y'all were so surprised when he walked in. She's like, yeah. Wait a minute. What do you mean all of y'all? I said, all y'all were so surprised. You wasn't surprised? Sir? No, I knew he was coming. What? You knew he was coming? Oh, yeah, me and him talked. When did y'all talk? All around lunchtime. No, you didn't. I said, yeah, we did. No, you didn't. Yeah, we did. <laughs> Boo. Oh, you hid that from me? I didn't hit it. He was coming. You was going to see. We all would see what was going to be revealed. She said, I can't believe you hide that. Who else knows? I said, well, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think anybody else. I mean, hey, if he called somebody else, that person didn't tell me, and I didn't tell them. So it looks like we did pretty good. I can't believe you. Then earlier this morning at church, what she do? She goes ranting around. I can't. Can you believe Lindsay hid that? Can you believe he kept that from us? You know, it, it, it sometimes for some people like myself, it may be easy to keep secrets. But when it comes to your faith, your faith is your faith is not the thing that's meant to be kept a secret. Amen. Your faith is the thing that should be told to anyone and everyone. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about when you walk into work tomorrow morning and somebody says, hey, how are you? I'm blessed and highly favored. And just literally slap them with the bacon grease. Don't do that. Don't do it. Miss. Put that away right now. But what you do is when somebody says, how are you doing? You be honest, but also you use that moment to point it back to Christ. If you are struggling, you say, listen, I'm having a rough time, but it is Jesus that is keeping me alive. You, you, even if it's a good time, oh, man, how are you doing? Man, I'm so good and I know I'm good because God has got me. Use any and every moment to point it back to Christ. Why? Because he saved you so you have broadcast it to everybody. So you, this is, listen, this is the one clause that you get to be loud. 
Amen. This is the one clause that everybody tells you to keep it quiet. Oh, you got to tone it down. Oh, you got to be low key. No, this is the one scripture. You get to be loud. You get to be boastful. You get to tell everybody about the good news. What is the good news? We sung it earlier that Jesus loves you and he loves you for the rest of your life. This is the good news. Amen. Amen. That he is for you. And guess what? If you're breathing, somebody say if you're breathing, if you are breathing, he's for you. That's the only clause. I got to be breathing and he's for me. Yes, Lindsay, if you are breathing, he is for you. And guess what? The empty grave shows that the life that he changes within us. And it all points that Jesus loves you. He loves you. Loves you. Unregardless. Unconditional. Amen. It all points that he loves us. So your faith is not given to be hidden. Your faith was not given to be hidden. Please remember that this morning. Your faith was not given to be hidden. So how do we practice that? Because, you know, I love to give you some Chick-fil-A nuggets and then we'll dip out this morning. We'll pray over the teachers, pray over the students, and then we'll, and then we'll leave. But how do we do this? It's, it's not enough just to hear about it. It's not enough to hear about the problem. It's not enough to see the scriptures. But we need to know what to do when we walk out those double doors. Amen. So watch this. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. He says, we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the spirit. Amen. I love this. So it literally says that we are being transformed. Y'all see that word transform? We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So it says being. It doesn't say that you have been transformed. It says that you are being. So that means it's a continual process. Amen. In the mirror translation, it says it better this way. I'm just going to read the yellow part. But it says, in gazing with wonder at the blueprint of God displayed in human form, that's Jesus, we suddenly realize that we are looking into a mirror where every feature of his image is articulated in Christ and it's reflected within us. Everything about Jesus is reflected in you. Everything about Jesus is reflected in you. He is not conformed to your image. He's not, he's, not, he's not who your denominations tell you to. He's not who the political parties tell us he is. He's not what our comforts tell As much as I love all the people that came before us, you have to have a personal relationship with the Lord. You cannot make it on your own, or you can't make it through this life depending on somebody else's prayer, depending on somebody else's revelation of God. I love my granny, but guess what? Granny, what works for granny, works for granny. I have to get in the throne room with God and say, Lord, show me who you are. She prayed me to a certain point, and guess what? I have to say, Lord, now it's my turn to start praying. You cannot depend on the prayers of everybody else to get you into the throne room of God. You have to make the decision on yourself and say, Lord, show me who you really are. Lead me, Jesus. Walk with me, Lord. How, well, well, let me say this this way. How much of an adult would I be if I still, you know, if I still sat in the back seat of my, of my parents' car? And they got out and opened the door for me and said, all right, little Lindsay, let's walk into the grocery store. Y'all, I'm 35 years old. I don't need them to do that. Well, how much, you know, if I was physically unable to do that, I can understand that. But where I am physically able, I don't need, they, listen, they got me to this point. Now watch this. I'm raising other ones. I got to get them to a certain point. When it comes to your spiritual walk of God, you cannot be dependent on anybody and everybody else to get you to where you need to be with God. You had to make the decision, Lord, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to, I'm going to watch and see how you do things, and then I'm going to emulate that in my job. I'm going to read the Gospels and see how you are patient with people, and then I'm going to practice patient with people. I can look in the Gospels and see how you did not judge, but how you embraced, and I'm going to do this. I'm literally mirroring what you are, Jesus. Literally, it says that everything he is, it's reflected in you. 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 Literally, we had Zendora's last night getting ice cream. And yes, Kelsey got her little thing. But all three boys, whether I didn't even tell them what to get, I didn't even tell them what flavor I was going to get. 
Two of them got my plan A flavor. The other one got my plan C flavor. And uh, we're all sitting there eating. And because I'm the daddy, I just take my spoon, just get a little bit of everybody's. You know, except for Kelsey, I don't like that one. But I got a little bit of everybody's just, Daddy, we didn't know you liked that. I do. Where, where do you think you got that desire to like that kind of flavor? I don't know. I just like it. Uh-huh. You got it. I, and I say, I can preach this right here in Zendora's, but I won't, little man. But I say, you got that from your daddy because we share the same DNA. And they're like, oh, so like, so things that you like, we kind of like. I said, that's true. I said, now, as you grow older, you will evolve and you will develop your own stuff. I said, but deep within your DNA is me. And I said, but deep within us, deep within our DNA is Jesus. Because God is conforming us to his image. Deep within you, there should be a desire to practice patience. Don't let that remain buried. Let it come to the top. Let it rise to the top. Let it resurrect to the top. Deep within you should be empathy. Don't let it be buried. Let it rise to the top. Deep within you should, should be joy. Let it rise to the top. In fact, the Holy Spirit, he helps us walk in the fruit of spirit. He helps us walk in that gentleness. He helps us walk in that peace. He helps us walk in that patience. He helps us walk in kindness and self-control. Deep within you, it's, it's in you. It's in your DNA. Don't let those things remain buried, but let them rise to the top. Why? Because you've been made in the image of God. You have been made in the image of Christ. Amen. He is the seed on the seed packet, or he is the pitcher on the seed packet for us. It's him who we are becoming like. We become like him by beholding him. We become like him by beholding him. Literally, the word behold, it means to focus. It means to gaze upon means to gaze upon when you gaze upon Jesus you become more like him when you spend time in his presence when you read his word and you're looking and you're seeing okay so he did that as you read it you become more like him you think about it the shows that we binge for those that binge shows if you're binging a show after three episodes if you're not careful you'll start to you'll start to play that out in your mind well I wonder if he would have did this what would have happened that way and you'll start to think about it even when you're away from the TV, even when you're driving down the road. Or somebody can say something and you'll be like, oh man, that reminds me of this one show. Why? Because you've beheld it and you are slowly becoming like it. We get around certain friends and we become around, we become like certain friends. I told this before, but you know, I have this one friend in Bristol. Whenever me and him talk on the phone, Kelsey can always tell it. Dre can always tell it when we talk is my my vernacular changes. I get a little bit more loose. I get a little bit more fun. I think I'm fun. Kelsey's more like, oh, you're, you're, stop. You got to stop. Why? Because as I behold him, as I get around him, he rubs off on me. And he's a good friend. Don't, don't think it's a bad thing. Is, is there evidence of Christ rubbing off on you? Is there evidence of Christ rubbing off on you? Is there evidence in your conversations? Is there evidence in, in the things that we choose to, to, to deem as entertainment? Is there, is there evidence of him existing in our life? Is there evidence of his power and his presence at work? Amen? Is there evidence of these things? If not, then we must behold him for all that he is. We must behold him for all that he is. Amen? Amen? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, thank you so much, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. We honor you. We exalt you, Jesus. We glorify your holy name, Lord. We glorify your holy name, Jesus. Right now, we surrender to you, Lord. As you make us good ground, Lord, conform us into the image of your Son. Continue, Lord, to conform us. Continue to shape us. Continue to mold us. Continue to direct us and lead us shape our tongue Lord to where we sound and we talk like you Jesus shape our actions God shape our mind to where we think like you Lord we, 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 we don't entertain any and every dark thought or any and every thought that is wasteful God right now Jesus Right now, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
Jesus, 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 Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Conform us to the image, Lord. Conform us to your image, Jesus. Conform us to your image, Lord. Thank you for listening to the True North Church podcast. If you're not already following us on social, check out our website at truenorth731.com to find direct links to our pages. Also, if you would like to contribute to the work we are trying to do, you can click the safe and secure giving link and follow the prompts. Thank you for helping us build and strengthen our community. Until next time, have a great day.